bless you. All right, why don't we go ahead and start? Um, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Arshak Navruzian. I'll give you guys a quick intro on myself, and then we'll get into the topic. Um, since this is a very small audience, it's at the end of the day, let's keep it very interactive, ask questions all along the way. As long as the answer doesn't you know, go more than five minutes, we're good. The question can be uh, as detailed as you like. So um, just a little bit about me. I'm a VP of product management for a company called Argyle Data. We're in the fraud space, so we use uh, a massive uh, database from the NSA called Accumulo. It's sort of a big table implementation similar to HBase uh, and machine learning technology to fight fraud within telco and financial services. Um, so before this I was at a company called Alpine Data Labs. That's a machine learning company on top of the Hadoop stack. Um, if you guys have heard of uh, Zipian Academy, they're a boot camp program. Uh, here in San Francisco, in 12 weeks, they'll turn you into a data scientist, provided you have a quantitative background. So if you already have a PhD from Stanford or MIT or Caltech, 12 more weeks, they'll turn you into a data scientist. Um, I organize a machine learning meetup group here in the city called SF Machine Learning. We have about 2,300 members. We've had some really interesting speakers over the last year or so, like Andrew Ang gave a talk on deep learning. Uh, we've had Michael Jordan from Berkeley give a talk on his uh, graphical models, RNNs, etc. It's a really great group. If you're interested, take a look. It's on the Meetup website, SF Machine Learning, one word. Uh, I teach machine learning classes regularly through Zipian Academy, General Assembly, if you guys do that sort of thing. And then um, I'm also involved in one other project that's re fairly recent. It's called Startup ML. Um, you know, just from my teaching, a lot of people would come up and say, yeah, you know, I'm working on a really cool IoT project or a healthcare 2.0 project. Uh, and we don't have anyone that does machine learning on the founding team. We'd love to get your help. So I got a bunch of my friends interested in this um, to be advisors, essentially. So for uh, startups that don't have, you know, machine learning engineers on the team, we lend you a machine learning engineer for a year from places like Amazon, LinkedIn, Facebook, like world-class people that you'd be hard-pressed to recruit when you're just a startup. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting model. We're working with a, a pretty uh, interesting group of, of folks, both on the advisor side and on the entrepreneur side. Uh, I contribute to a couple of uh, open source projects, one of which we're gonna go into great detail today called Wopal Wabbit. Uh, I know it's a silly name. Um, came out of Microsoft Research. It's, a, it's the package that we're going to talk about that does um, trillion feature uh, models. And then Apache Cumulo, as I said, this a database that came out of the NSA. Interesting technology as well. So what's machine learning about? By the way, how many of you are kind of active practitioners in the ML space right now? Okay. Okay. Two and a half? Cool. Great. So. Uh, if this stuff keep, keeps kind of going deeper and deeper, just, just you know, come ask questions along the way. Um, but yeah, just some le high level use cases. Um, you know, you, you use machine learning every day of your life, right? At this point, you know, when you do a Google search, that's all machine learning, both the indexing and, you know, knowing what your query intention is. Um, Google Now, if you guys use that, that's just loaded with machine learning, right? It knows where you parked, for example. It doesn't ask you that. It just sort of figures it out. Um, spam detection, very you know simple but very effective use of machine learning. Uh, speech recognition, right? I can, without touching my phone, I can say machine learning, and it turns on. Um, that's speech recognition. It's 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 got it's gotten quite good actually. Um, fraud detection, that's the domain that, that I work in. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's becoming almost uh, mandatory to do fraud detection through ML because, um, you know, traditional techniques of trying to write rules, um, trying to catch this stuff through heuristics is becoming impossible. In fact, there's a whole field called adversarial machine learning where the system that you're trying to learn doesn't want to be learned, doesn't want to be detected. Unlike nature, which is sort of benevolent, it doesn't care whether you learn or not. Adversarial machine learning, your adversary is trying to outgun you with algorithms. So it's an interesting specialized field. 
Yeah, you know, computer systems, computer networks, you guys are well aware of what's going on. Every bank seems to have gotten hacked at this point. Right? Um, what was the joke? If I used my JP Morgan uh, card and I shopped at Home Depot, did I get hacked twice? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just ridiculous, right? Um, yeah. Um, and you know some of the very inspiring areas, the autonomous driving vehicle, if you guys have seen the Google self-driving car up and down the fly freeway, um, it's, um, or the 101, I should say. It's, um, yeah, it's very interesting what, it's, what, what, what the possibilities are. Then there are some evil uses of machine learning, right? We all see, on average, um, 1,700 uh, banner ads. Um, we have a higher likelihood of getting bitten by a snake than clicking on those banner ads, so I don't know why people keep showing them to us. Um, there's a really memorable quote from one of the Cloudera guys, um, Jeff Hammerbacher. He said, um, it's sad that some of the best minds in our, of our generation are working on you know, this ad tech space, you know, just putting more and more ads in front of you. They could be doing science, they could be doing other things. Um, yeah, high frequency trading, there's a lot of machine learning there, not sure it does society very much good other than a few individuals. Uh, recommender systems, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're really creepy, right? Some of the, some, sometimes you were like, how did LinkedIn figure it out that I'm somehow connected to this person? In fact, the economist said that LinkedIn was creepy, I'm just quoting that directly. Um, yeah, credit scoring, right, that could get predatory. Um, and then if Google get, Glass gets facial recognition, I think that would be horrible too, because you just would lose all your on anonymity. And I, I think the technology is there now, actually. Uh, Facebook had this paper they released called Deep Face, um, where an algorithm, deep learning algorithm, created by Jan Lacan from NYU and his team, is able to um, recognize faces, you know, regardless of perspective and pixel size and who else is in that image, et cetera, with 97.8% accuracy. So it can actually outperform humans at recognizing human faces. So that technology exists already. They could very easily couple it with Google uh, Glass, but they choose not to because of, I think, the societal implications could be really negative. You do sort of an instant background check everywhere. And everyone you see just would, would not be good. So for you to decide, you know, do you want to be part of this or not? I think there, there's both the good and, and, and an ugly side to machine learning. Um, these guys are academics. They don't, they don't understand the real world. All they want to do is just research um, <laughs> this machine learning area. And they're really phenomenal academics. Um, John Langford is at Microsoft Research. I really consider him as sort of one of the living fathers of, of machine learning. Some of the ideas that he's come up with are, are very, very unique. Um, and Wolpel Wabbit is, is essentially his, his brainchild. It's a 100% open source BSD license tool. Any one of you can download and compile and use. I'll show you guys some uses of it today. Um, but yeah, they've done a really interesting job. And, and Wolpel Wabbit essentially for them is a research vehicle. So they want to essentially advance machine learning and now artificial intelligence as a field and they just need to prove that in some software. So they're not write, writing it to be this commercial software ready for the average enterprise to use. They just want to show that their research is valid and they just need to implement it in some software to validate to, 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 as a manifestation of the research. But it's, it's decent quality software. It's being used at Amazon. I think Facebook uses it. eHarmony uses it. There's, there's about half a dozen or a dozen commercial organizations that actually use it in production as well. So what were the motivations behind uh, VW? And this category of, of machine learning is called incremental machine learning. And there, to my knowledge, there's basically two big packages. Uh, VW is one, and there's one called Sophia ML that came out of uh, Google. Uh, I think VW is a little bit more feature reach and more easily accessible. But if you're interested, the other one is, is Sophia. You can look at, look at that as well. So um, the biggest thing that they wanted to do with um, VW is show that you can learn very, very large data sets, um, gigabyte, terabyte, potentially petabyte data sets, but do it on a small computational footprint. So you don't have to be Google, you don't have to have 10, you know, you guys heard the experiment that Andrew Ng did at 
with um, you know having computers watch YouTube videos and eventually the computers you know, this deep learning model uh, discovered cats and human faces and bicycles in a completely unsupervised way so no human was you know involved in teaching the model how to tag things it just watched enough I think it watched a month of YouTube videos um, with a cluster of a thousand computers and then eventually started identifying these concepts so if you have that kind of computational power at your disposal, right, if you have 16,000 cores, and I think the power bill just for that exercise was like $3 million. So if you have that, great. If you don't have it, then incremental learning is a really interesting way of doing things because you can incrementally learn very large data sets, uh, but not have to put everything in memory at once, not have to dedicate 16,000 cores to the computation. You just take sort of a fixed window of memory, it could be as small as like two megabytes of memory, and you stream your terabyte data set through that two megabyte memory, and you try to learn everything you can from that two megabytes that you're looking at right now. What's interesting is you can learn very good models with this technique, right? And I can show you some comparisons where something like random forests, where you know it requires you to put all the data in memory and potentially do lots of passes over it. Um, in, in a lot of cases is not that much not that, not that not that much more accurate than these sorts of linear models um, so one of the uh, some of the areas where there are really good papers from these guys that you can look up if you're interested in this incremental learning techniques are um, you know the, doing progressive validation traditional machine learning one one way that you can tell whether you trained a good model or not is you have a hold back set you say, I'm going to take my data set, let's say I have a thousand observations, and they're, they've been labeled by some human or process, and I'm doing a classification exercise. Um, you would do something like a 70, 30, or an 80, 20 split of your labeled data set. You would train on that 70%, let's say, the model, and then you would pass the 30% through um, as a test set to see how well you did. Right, so that you don't just go out into the real world with this model and make horrible predictions, you're, you're testing your model. So that's great if you can take the data set and split it, et cetera, right, if, if you have that kind of luxury. But when I'm dealing with these kinds of very large data sets and very limited amount of compute, I can't even do that kind of splitting of my data. Um, so they came up with this technique of instead of doing holdout validation, they do progressive validation where the model essentially makes a prediction on every observation and then gets the true label and sees how well it did and if it didn't make a correct prediction it adjusts the model on an ongoing basis. So a lot of my, the, the point I'm trying to make without getting into the nitty gritty is it's not that they just implemented the software in a clever way, they had to actually make a lot of sort of theoretical breakthroughs in the field of machine learning to make this software possible, to prove that you can achieve good results with progressive, as good a result with progressive validation as you can do with the holdout methodology. Does that make sense, everything I'm saying so far? Yeah, it's mainly a supervised uh, machine learning package. So what it does is, you know, classification, regression. Um, it, there are a couple of unsupervised areas. It does um, um, topic, topic modeling like LDA and then also has uh, matrix factorization. But everything else is, is, is supervised, so it does um, cost-sensitive um, uh, classification and contextual bandits and stuff like that, but everything is on label data. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, a lot of what happens in machine learning these days is on labeled, right? We're running out of labeled data. Where there's not enough humans to label data for machine learning algorithms. And that's what deep learning is about, right? So deep learning tries to learn the representation of the data versus having to just work off of, of labeled data. <clears throat> yeah, and by the way, it's, um, I think as far as I know, Wopal Wabbit is still the uh, sort of champion of machine learning. If you guys want to pull up a YouTube video uh, called Sybil, this, is, this was from last year, I think it was at ICML. So Google sort of did it, they didn't open source anything, but they just said, here's what state-of-the-art machine learning looks like inside of Google, and this is how we do YouTube um, recommendations on what video you should watch next. And we use a tool called Sybil, and this is what it does. It's a boosting technique, and 
this is how we create our features and this is how we train our models, et cetera. And this is the sort of performance we achieve and their performance was um, two million features per second per uh, CPU core. Um, this is published to do four million features per second per CPU core. So I think Wobble Lab is actually better than anything Google has. So I think Langford is still waiting for someone to beat this uh, record. And it's 20,000 lines or less than 20,000 lines of C, C++ code, so. Um, so, who cares about online learning, right? We were talking about this before. Why don't I just do this with R? Have you guys heard of R? It's like a stats tool. It's very feature rich. I've only said every algorithm seems to get implemented in R first. But then try to take a data set that's more than 1,000 observations. You know? At 10,000 already, you're having trouble. At 100,000, it's crashing. You forget about millions. Um, you can train models with this that have, you know, literally like billions of um, observations to them. So I'm going to show you guys a quick example. Um, let's see. We can do cover type. If you guys want to see something non-linear, this is a classic data set. It's um, essentially 53 fields, and we know. Um, uh, for different soil plots, um, what the elevation is of that soil plot, what how much rainfall it gets, how far it, is it from the uh, uh, nearest body of water, et cetera. And we're trying to predict one out of every one out of seven classes what type of a tree would grow there. So if I know these characteristics about a plot of soil, it's like a USGS exercise. I can predict what kind of tree would go, grow there. It's it's. The reason it's interesting is it's very non-linear, right? So it's a, it's like a classic. Every ML paper you pull up that has you know support vector machines, kernels, random forests, etc., you'll see this data set being mentioned um, called cover type. So this is, you know, it's not like really really big data, but it's got half a million observations. Like you can't train cover type inside of an R inside of R. It doesn't work. It just it'll blow up. So we can train cover type here on one. See, it's about this last bit. Okay, done. We created a model with 0.6% um, error. So by today's standards, this is pretty bad because you can train, you know, 10 decision trees in an ensemble like random forests and do like 90%, 96% accuracy on cover type. So if you get a really good non-linear learner, it can outperform this. But Ten years ago, you could publish a paper. If you could get 26% error on cover type, that was publishable. That was phenomenal, right? It used to be like 60% was as accurate as machine learning would get on cover type. So my point is, you did this. It's very quick. You used very little memory, and we learned it very fast. That model's been trained. We could do something even more massive. So I have a couple other data sets here. This is RCV1. It's a... Um, Reuters data set, okay? It's 130 megs. Uh, compressed, yeah? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Let's see if you can see this. It's better? Okay, so this is binary classification. So what Reuters put out this data set, and um, it's basically um, documents, and you're trying to categorize 
the documents um, into two, two buckets. Is this related to business topics or not? Okay, so Reuters, they're crawling the web, they're finding different things, they want to just categorize it. So we're going to learn this data set. So you just say VW, this is compressed, right, our source file. We're doing binary classification. This is our train data. Um, that's all we have to do. This is purely linear. This data set doesn't have any nonlinearity, so we don't have to do that cubic expansion and all that. So we learned the model. It only has 5% error, right? And we did it in pretty record time. I think it's... Do it again. So on my Mac, we did it in five seconds. So you've learned 130 megabytes of compressed data. I think if I compress this, it's over a gigabyte. Um, I'll show you guys one other trick, which is we're going to actually do cluster parallel learning. So I'll launch a couple of these, and we'll essentially get individual uh, Wopal Wabbit instances to learn a subset of the data and then share the results. So the point of that is you can get, you know, 20 computers, let's say, on Amazon or Google Compute or in your enterprise environment, launch this kind of parallel cluster learning and learn some really massive data sets, data sets that are in potentially hundreds of, of, of terabytes. So let's walk through, why is this thing so fast? What have they done? And if you watch that Google video that I mentioned, a lot of the same concepts show up in the Google video. So Google's sort of independently figured out all the same tricks. So one thing that it does, the way it's, the, how it's getting away with this, you know, very small memory window, is it uses a hashing trick internally. So um, essentially, imagine I have two different observations. You know, let's say it's a classification problem. I know one of my observations is a male, age 40 is divorced. The other observation is female, age uh, 29, single. So these features essentially are getting hashed to different places into, into a fixed size hash map. And it's kind of like a counting hash map. So it sees another observation, it hashes those values to my hash map, and it adjusts the weights. It says, oh, okay, so we've seen another male that's age 40 and divorced and probably overweight as an example, right? If this is an indication for overweight, then I'm gonna increase the weight in that bucket within my hash map. That's what it's doing. So that's, that's the trick that it uses. That's why the models are so s small and they can fit in memory as it uses this hashing trick internally. Another trick that these guys came up with is this concept of reductions, where um, you take problems that are pretty complex, like uh, structured prediction problems, as an example. If you guys have ever seen uh, part of speech tagging, like I take a sentence and I have the computer tell me this is the noun, this is the verb, this is the adverb, this is an adjective, etc. Well, you can't, you don't look at every word, but you have to look at the word and what's next to those words, what came before, what came after, etc. So it's structured learning, right? It's a little bit more complicated. But it turns out you can break these problems down to something very simple. So you can create these series of reductions where your core learning that has the, the core machine learning algorithm is always a weighted binary classifier. It knows how to do one thing and it does it really, really well. And all these higher level abstractions, other kinds of functions that you do want to do within machine learning, um, sort of applied machine learning can be reduced down to this binary classification. This is a really powerful concept. Because, as I mentioned in my, in my bio before, I was VP of product management for a company that basically built machine le learning tools for a living. And we, w we didn't have anything like this. We would just sort of develop an algorithm from scratch. We'd say, today we're writing support vector machine with multiple kernels, and let's put the brightest kid we've just hired out of Stanford on the project, and he'll get it right. And mostly that was the case, but they would often make errors in just the absolute core logic of the machine learning model. Um, so it would take us, you know, months and years to find these errors and fix them, etc. Um, what this approach allows you to do is you write an abstraction, but your core learning logic never changes. So it's less prone to, to making significant errors. The other thing, if you guys decide to practice with this, and as I said, you can download it and install it on your machine and, and off you go, is it's got this very flexible model. Um, they kind of call it this um, combinatoric design of, of Wopal Wabbit. 
a lot of machine learning algorithms that you might get in R or Python or a lot of other languages, they have a fixed set of assumptions. Like they have a particular way of doing things. Like the guy that wrote this machine learning algorithm decided on your behalf what objective function should be used, like what loss function should be used. Um, or what optimizer, like he's a fan of BFGS quasi-Newtonian and that's what he used, or he's a fan of stochastic gradient descent, that's what he used, right? Um, what I love about VW is it's totally flexible. I can go back to that command line that we just ran and say, let's swap out the loss function. So its default loss function is um, squared loss, let's do hinge. Hinge loss is um, support vector machine. It's a completely different shape loss function. There's our result. I'm getting something similar. Or I can do logistic, right? If I want to turn it into log reg, there's what it looks like in log reg. I can say, yeah, you know, let's go back. This, it, 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 its default learner, its default optimizer is adaptive stochastic gradient descent. I may say, I don't understand adaptive. I want to go back to classic stochastic dis gradient descent. So I say dash dash HGD, which changes my optimizer. Or I can change it in a really radical way by saying, forget these stochastic gradient descent out derivatives. Let's go back to a good old quasi-Newtonian. Let's do BFGS. It's telling me for BFGS, I need to do two passes. It's not a single pass, like stochastic gradient descent. So let's do that. So passes two, and then cache the, the output. You can see the output changes, but it's, 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 doing, you know, it's doing an exact solver now. We're not in the stochastic gradient descent optimizer. We're in a completely different category of optimization. This sort of mixing and matching um, you know, I can change my optimizer. Um, I can change um, what nonlinearity function I want to use. So I have cubic, quadratic. I can use neural nets, on and on and on. All that stuff is essentially just a bunch of flags. And the reason it, it works like that is because of this reduction design. I can say I want to do one against all multi-class or I want to do error correcting tournament, ECT, lots of different kinds of multi-class algorithms. So for any given application, you guys can try this. This is really fun. Uh, pull up scholar.google.com and take any random combination. I'll send you guys these slides if anyone's interested and say, okay, find me a paper that argues that the best possible machine learning is this random combination that you should be using um, sparse features, and you should be using hinge loss with n-grams where your optimizer is online, and, and you'll find some academics saying this is absolutely the mecca of machine learning. It's this, it's this, right? But then just, just change it to some other random combination, you'll find that paper as well. So machine learning is not a, a, a finalized sort of a mature science. A lot of it is art. So when it's in that state, as a field, it's good to have flexible tools, right? That way you're not buying into any one person's dogma. You can just say, I want to try this other approach. Maybe I'll get better results. Um, how do you format your files if you want to try this out? It's actually fairly close to a popular form format called SVM Lite um, from LibSVM. It's, re it's really simple. So you give it the label, the, you know, for the training set, you already have labeled data. Label comes first, followed by a pipe. And then the rest is essentially the feature space. And you don't have to do any special processing of the features. In fact, have, has anyone ever tried text mining here by any chance, like natural language processing? Have you guys? No? OK, so machine learning, the problem is with strings, with text, right? There's, there's nothing for the computer to learn. It doesn't understand. You have to turn it into a bunch of numbers. Same thing with like image processing, right? If you just give it an image, it's what the hell do I do with this? Like, give me something I can memorize here. Turn it into like pixel densities or pixel values or something like that. Or turn it into a bunch of edges and I can memorize those edges. So you have to do some sort of pre-processing with a lot of machine learning. So if it's NLP, 
There's an algorithm called TFIDF, which looks at term frequencies, inverse document frequency, and says, okay, for this word, this is the number. And you have to do that in order to learn NLP problems. Let me show you how, with this thing, you don't have to. You can just give it the raw text. So we'll go back to that data set. So I have another version of that Reuters data set that's actually the raw version. And let me just show you guys a little preview of it. Hopefully, I don't have to uncompress it. Okay, here it is. So this looks like that input file format, right? So one is the label, meaning the yes, it's a business document, followed by a pipe. The rest are the features. In this case, I can just put the raw words. I got all the, you know, I got rid of the stop words, right? That a, the, at, to, all those things that just don't mean anything in language. I just put all the nouns, essentially, like the significant words from that document. There it is. We can learn this just like we can the, you know. So here's, this is the raw version. And this is the version we were learning before. This is the process versions. Someone's gone through and turned those words into numbers, essentially, right? So most all NLP packages, natural language processing packages you'll touch, you'll see that the file looks like this. It looks like a bunch of numbers. We're going to learn the raw version. So let's go back. All I have to do is just put in raw, and we'll go back to stochastic gradient descent. There. So we can learn it just based on the raw words. The reason this works is because of that hashing trick. It doesn't need a number. It can use the word. It's hashing it to the same place, and it's putting a weight on it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, sure. You would, you would run it against, against the test set or start making predictions. So you can run this thing in daemon mode put it on a port and start sending it data. So now I give it an unlabeled sequence. I say I've got these words in my document. Is this a business document? It'll tell you one or no, you know, one or, or, or a negative one. Yeah, you just say dash dash daemon. Or you can just give it a file and say do a test run. So like, here's a, so let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, let's go back to the training, right? So we'll do this, and then we'll say, let's save the model, right? So RCV1 model. So this time, I'm training it, but I'm actually saving my model. Next, I'm going to give it a data set. Uh, no, I mean, in this case, I want to see how well it's doing against the label data set. But yeah, I could use an unlabeled data set and have it give me predictions. Yeah, you could. You could. Yep. Could you say again the what, what it learned in that test example? I think I missed. What it learned? Let's see. So we can do this thing. It's got a. So we train this model again. Okay, and then here's my human readable model. So essentially, these are the hash blocking values. I can do an inverted hash, too, if I want to see what's actually in there. Let's just try that really quick. This will take longer to train when you invert the hash. But. 
So that was kind of the numeric version of the hash. And then let's see the inverted hash. Yeah, I mean, you guys can see you can become a ninja in something like this really, really quickly, and you're going to sort of jump to the right to the top of, of the machine learning stack. Like all the people that are playing around with R and stuff like that, you can just blow past them. Uh, you stated earlier, and I, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly, that VW is essentially a linear learner. And yes. to do non-linearities, you must expand the feature space for the kernel function or uh, yeah, we, it now supports kernel functions, but it, it does something much simpler than that. It does uh, cubic and quadratic expansion. Oh, that's why I don't think it's cubic, is it actually expands from the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does, the, there is a new implementation of a, it, it, it supports a, like polynomial kernels. I think it is, yeah, because um, if you're l trying to learn big data, it's it's not easy to do that with R. Yeah, so thanks for asking that question. <laughs> it does have a neural net implementation. It's a one hidden layer neural net. So all you have to do is just say dash dash and then a number of neurons you want. That's it. Uh, yeah, if you want to play around with it, you can set the learning rate. Um, although I think I've never seen I've never seen it do better. Like I use um, their hyperparam search. I've never seen it do better than the, their adaptive learning rate. So you don't have to do much. No. This doesn't run on GPU yet, but there it's sort of on the roadmap. Sorry, you had a question? Open CV. So that's sort of a thing you would use as a preprocessor. So you'd use Open CV to do some feature extraction out of your image data and then feed it to VW to actually learn it. see that IH. So you can see here are the words and their weights now because we did the inverted hash. So that's the actual model. Yeah, so um, if you guys have ever uh, heard of this famous, I think the guy that came up with the word data science is DJ Patel, so that he claims. And the other quote he has is 80% of data science is essentially feature engineering. It is. That's where deep learning comes in. So if you want to skip all that, skip all the signal processing and all that stuff, go right to learning representations or you want, you want to go for deep learning. Because that's like all domain expertise, right? Knowing these textures and pixel proximity and creating super pixels and all this other stuff, that's all you know, image processing domain knowledge. People, you know, spent years writing papers and PhDs on this stuff. Or you can just ignore all that and just say, I want you to learn all that stuff. I don't know it. You know, I want you to just learn it. So deep learning is able to find those representations internally. But it's only useful sort of in a couple of domains, right? So image, image, you know, essentially, it's like computer vision domain and, and audio recognition domain. Um, who wants to see parallel VW? I know this is like already, you know, so exciting, but there's there's more. <laughs>
So cluster parallel, it's called the old reduce. This is really interesting, I think. Have you guys heard of Torch or um, you have? Um, or Theano, like a lot of these GPU-based deep learning tools, they're fantastic like in one box with one Tesla card, but what if I want to do like 10 of these things? And interestingly, those guys haven't yet fully figured out how to do distributed learning. Um, even like these cutting edge guys at, at Facebook and Google and Montreal Lisa Labs, University of Montreal Lisa Labs. Um, and I was talking to a few of these guys recently and they're looking to John Langford's all reduce as the potential methodology to, to fix that problem. So the way all reduce works is really, really fascinating. It's a two pass uh, way of doing things. Um, so distributed learning, the problem is we don't have global view of the data anymore, right? I have a Hadoop node, let's say. That Hadoop node has some random amount of data on it because Hadoop is a distributed file system. I can only see that data. I can potentially get access to other data, but it's expensive to get access. I don't want to do that. Right? I want to learn the best thing I can learn from the subset of the data I have. Um, so a lot of machine learning algorithms over the last few years, like Spark ML, Lib, Cloud Aero's Oryx, et cetera, they just say, okay, well, this is how we do you know, machine learning in the distributed world. We learn what we can from each node, then we average the answer across all the nodes, and that's the best we can do. It's sort of an approximate answer, not nearly as good as what you could have potentially learned if you could see a global view of the data. Okay? So v this all reduced methodology fixes it. It actually looks at the local data set with a single pass of stochastic gradient descent, just to sort of find the best neighborhood, and then establishes its own computational model. So you can do this through Hadoop. You launch these sort of map-only jobs. They bring up VW instances everywhere. These VW instances connect to each other on like a special TCP port. And they start chatting. And what they're doing essentially is helping each other find the globally optimized solution. So they do one stochastic gradient descent pass each, and then they wait for each other. And when everyone is done doing that, they do a BFGS pass. So they now use an exact solver, and they essentially um, uh, bootstrap it with the answer from the stochastic gradient descent pass. So your BFGS converges is much, much faster because you've already done a stochastic gradient descent. So it's really cool. And I think if you guys want to, do you guys want to see me type for 15 minutes to, to <laughs> no, no one cares? Okay. Um, if anyone wants to, I can send you notes on how to play this back. It's, uh, you can, you can reproduce it on your laptop. Like you can, set up two instances online for each other. Um, okay, so yeah, it's all reduced. And then I want to just leave you guys with some um, resources. So this, this, these are some of the wonderful academics you should be following um, if you're interested in this field. Uh, Jeff Hinton, brilliant guy from um, University of Toronto. He built your, you guys ever upload images to Google Plus and then notice that it's tagging them for you without you having to do it? Um, it's using Hinton's algorithm. It's essentially a deep learning algorithm. Jan the Khan is at Facebook. He's deep face. He's, he essentially cracked facial recognition once and for all. He can do it better than humans can. Um, Langford is in there. Andrew Ang, I think, is, is a rock star as well. He was at Stanford. He did this exercise with the Google Brain. And then now he's at Baidu. He has a $300 million lab. Um, he can just call up the CEO of Baidu and ask for a million more GPUs and get it the next day. If you're an NVIDIA developer, he's hiring. Um, and then some other interesting folks. Stanford has a really interesting optimization guy. Alex Mola is a kernel machine guy. So um, if you want to go really deep into this incremental learning area, um, there's a really good MOOC I would recommend. Um, that's the URL. It's essentially Jan Lacan and Langford teaching a class together at NYU. So it sort of alternates. One day Langford teaches on incremental learning. The next day um, Lacan teaches on Lua, basically the torch stuff. So how to do deep learning. It's really, really good. And then if you really want to bore yourself to tears, there are lots of machine learning conferences you can go to. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is this is a little bit of a pipe dream, right? I think, uh, because we built the whole company, raised like forty million dollars of venture money with this notion that we're going to build a tool, we're going to put it in the hands of BI people, you know, business intelligence people or business analysts, and they're going to do machine learning. I don't know. You know, if like if you can't tell the difference between you know, clustering and classification, that's like, you know, you, 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 need, to, you need to look at some Coursera classes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, I think you do need some sort of a foundation. But there's, there's a difference between that and going into, you know, Python and writing an algorithm from scratch yourself. Like, that's another level of math. So I would say you need a solid foundation in just the functional aspects of it, which you can get by looking at MOOCs and reading a couple books and papers, um, and then using tools like this that are kind of off-the-shelf implementations of algorithms that you don't have to become a you know, full-blown statistician, mathematician, and a computer scientist and be writing this stuff. You don't have time. You're here for the HTML conference, right? <laughs> yes. It's, there's no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't distinguish between the two. Deep learning is a type of machine learning. The only thing that's novel about deep learning is that, that it's doing representation learning. So in this case, we're giving it these features, right? With deep learning, you're giving it some sort of a raw input, and it's learning the features. Yeah, and then it just keeps learning different layers. So it says, I have pixels. From pixels, I'm going to learn edges. From edges, I'm going to learn um, um, like different shapes. From shapes, I'm going to learn your actual face, right? So that's what deep learning is about. It's just doing more, you know, a bunch of individual machine learning models like this and then stacking them all together and then doing convolution between them, all this crazy mumbo jumbo. It works, but it's, it's just more f sophisticated machine learning. Sometimes works. <laughs> Time series data, machine learning. Yes, what, what sort of data are you thinking about? Yeah, sensor data. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I'm teaching an ML class on Thursday, and we're going to cover this a little bit, just getting sort of the same reading from the same sensor over and over. Um, hidden Markov models are pretty useful for that, I find. Um, Coleman filters. Um, but you can also, I think the, the example I'm going to give on, on Thursday is accelerometer data. So I have a phone, it's in my pocket, it's got a three-axis accelerometer. Um, and from that, we want to be able to detect is the user walking, jogging, sitting, standing, walking upstairs, coming downstairs, sort of thing. Um, it turns out it's really easy to turn that into a machine learning problem. So you take 10 points from each x, y, and z. So it's, it is time series, but you're just kind of flipping it, you're pivoting it, right? You turn that into an observation, and you can turn, train like a random forest model, and with 80% accuracy, tell it, you know, which one of those activities is the user doing right now. So I'm going to run people through that exercise on Thursday. It's a relative new, new field, right? I think time series as an input into machine learning models is somewhat new. I think Wall Street people do it quite a bit with neural nets to predict you know, stock market pricing and things like that. So you have to come up with sort of your own ways of breaking it down into something that you can input into a machine learning algorithm. Um, I mean, it's just you know, scholar.google.com, just say time series machine learning. You'll come up with a ton of papers. Any other applications? <laughs> How do you use video? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can pull this up really quick. 
So Yana Khan did this recently. Um, it's Google open sourced a million YouTube videos that have uh, sports content, and they essentially put out like a competition to classify the sport in question in an on uh, in a non-supervised way. So you need to have a a machine learning algorithm watch a video and tell you what sport is in that video. Um, let me see if it'll. I know. It, Opening Google. I need to change that. It's getting a little um, GPU. You should be friends with Jan Lacan, by the way, on Google Plus. He's a wealth of knowledge. Um, come on, where is it? video classification 200 frame Gaussian so it's really cool so it's um, trying to cla uh, classify the top three candidates so it doesn't know exactly what it is so it thinks this is free writing and it's it's gotten the labels from the comments actually look at this wheelchair basketball it's pretty cool right and it so candidate one is wheelchair basketball basketball mixed martial arts so it's completely unsupervised. You can get access to this code if you want, but it's a lot of pre-processing. So you have to pull out still frames, do a bunch of image processing on those still frames, on and on and on, and then you have data that you can learn from. I think what, what I see is also machine learning becoming sort of an API. So I see a ton of little companies that want to have this or that use case and just say, hey, what do you need? Like you have text and you need to tell me what language it is, I have a function for that. Like, you don't have to know how I do it. So you'll see these sorts of things as well pop up. Like, you stream my video in and I'll tag it for you or I'll do whatever you need. Sure, you could spend a couple years doing that for sure. Yeah, so here's the... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so here's, here's large-scale video classification with convolutional networks, right? So they tell you in a paper how they did it. You know, there's a picture of the different models they used, and these are all the layers they had, and et cetera. So it took how many PhDs? Let's count them. <laughs> and a grant from Google Research. But I think this sort of stuff has just become, like, just like VW is a pa you know, piece of software you can download and it does all these really cool um, use cases. I think even this stuff is becoming available. Like, Jan Lacan has um, this thing called Overfeet, which will do unsupervised image classification. Um, I think I have it installed. But I mean, you can just download it. It's fully trained, it's based on ImageNet. You don't have to know how he trained it, you can just benefit from it. Give it any image, and it'll tell you what's in there. Yeah, actually, th this um, ImageNet um, is is dropped from two years ago. It's thirty six percent error. They just published the papers at KDD. It's down to like four percent error, five percent error. So it's fantastic. Yeah, top three categories. So within one of those top three answers is the right answer essentially. Well, look, so this was not meant as a technical deep dive. Maybe it got more weight to technical. But I think the idea is just to kind of inspire you to look at this stuff. It's accessible. Um, you know, there are resources for you to, to look at and take next steps on. Um, a lot of it is in the open source, right? You don't have to go buy expensive commercial software. I encourage you to uh, do something with it. And if you have questions, contact me. I'd love I mean, I, every time I teach, I end up sort of getting tons of questions afterwards. I'm happy to help if I can in any way. Okay, thanks.